Zylara prided herself on her open mind. As a xenoanthropologist with the esteemed Kalshayan Institute, she'd studied countless cultures, dissecting their rituals, values, and histories with an objective eye. The universe, she believed, was a tapestry woven from threads of difference, and only by understanding those differences could true harmony emerge. Then came the humans. Her initial scan of their records nearly made her delete the files. War. Not isolated skirmishes or territorial disputes. Those sadly peppered the galactic timeline, but systematic, industrialized, planet-scorching war. Century after century of brutality that made her delicate chitin prickle with revulsion. What other species dedicated such ingenuity to devising ever more efficient ways of killing their own kind? A primitive blip, her supervisor Valara, had soothed when Zylara voiced her concerns. With enough guidance, they'll evolve past this unpleasantness. The platitude did nothing to erase the images seared into her mind. Mushroom clouds blooming, scarred soldiers with haunted eyes, the endless lists of the dead enumerated with chilling precision. Were these humans a contagion to be isolated, quarantined for the good of the civilized galaxy? The mandate for her upcoming research project burned on her datapad. Observation and analysis of human sociocultural development, a pathway to harmonious integration. Harmonious? Zylora suppressed a shudder. She would conduct her research, present a clinically factual report, and then request immediate reassignment. Perhaps those fluffy, arboreal beings from the Trillian sector needed cataloging. They seemed harmless enough. Her arrival on Earth was a blur of sterile labs and hastily constructed simulations meant to create a neutral environment. The humans, to their credit, were efficient and jarring. So much exposed skin and those unnervingly forward-facing eyes that seemed to bore into her. Then there was him. Marcus, he'd introduced himself, his voice a low rumble that vibrated through the pristine white room. Tall, broad-shouldered, with a jawline that could have chipped stone. An apex predator from a barbaric world. He was, objectively, a beautiful specimen. Yet Zylara couldn't quell the instinctive recoil. Zylara, she'd managed, her voice a few octaves too high. Attached researcher from the Kalshayan Institute. His smile disarmingly gentle did little to alleviate her unease. Welcome to Earth, Zylara. I'll be your primary liaison. Liaison, a polite word for what this human must see her as, a babysitter come to tame the savage beast. The first few weeks were an exercise in controlled discomfort. Zalara buried herself in human history, analyzing battles, deciphering strategy treatises, poring over casualty reports. The sheer scale of calculated violence left her nauseated. Marcus was a constant, looming presence. At first, she suspected it was deliberate a human intimidation tactic. Yet he rarely spoke of war directly, and when he did, it was with a quiet weariness that baffled her. He showed her images of vibrant cities, clips of children laughing, explained concepts like art, music, and philosophy, all flowering on a soil stained with blood. Contradictions, she muttered to herself one evening, staring at a holographic projection of a human symphony orchestra. The music was hauntingly beautiful. A monstrously contradictory species. Marcus, apparently drawn by her outburst, stepped closer. More like complex, he said softly. Complex. It was a less damning word. Their conversations slowly stretched beyond the sterile confines of the observation rooms. Marcus showed her training simulations, not for the weapons or combat tactics, but for the flashes of camaraderie, the way humans instinctively move to protect one another, share burdens. She found herself dissecting these interactions as intently as any battle map. Tell me, she found herself asking during a rare lull, the formality of her title discarded, why do you fight? The change in Marcus was immediate. The easygoing human vanished, replaced by a soldier honed by some unseen fire. I fight so that others don't have to, his voice echoed in the suddenly too large room. It should have been a chilling declaration, Yet his weathered eyes held no bloodlust, only a grim determination. Zylara, so used to the cool logic of her own kind, was unprepared for the raw emotion blazing in this human. It was unsettling, and if she dared to be honest with herself, strangely compelling. A week later, the simulation began. 
They were to be part of an emergency response team reacting to a hypothetical disaster. A test of cooperation, the human administrators had assured her. Zylara had scoffed inwardly. How could a species so steeped in conflict ever work in true harmony with others? The simulation was shockingly realistic. Not the staged disaster itself, the collapsing building, the panicked crowds, but the cold fear that clenched her insides. There was no time to process, to analyze. The piercing screams, the smell of acrid smoke, overloaded her senses. Marcus, in contrast, was a force of nature. He barked orders, his voice cutting through the chaos, and the humans around them responded with drilled precision. He pulled a whimpering child from the simulated rubble, then knelt beside her, murmuring reassurances. Zylara felt frozen useless. We need triage over here, Marcus called out, and she stumbled forward, suddenly aware of the med kit strapped to her side. She knew the procedures by theory alone, had never touched an injured being in her life. Her scholarly detachment crumbled. Blood looked the same on any sentient creature, she realized with a jolt. The injured woman she was assigned to had a fractured leg, the sight of bone protruding through skin turning Zylara's stomach. Yet she forced herself to act, to recall the steps drilled into her during the rushed pre-simulation training. Hours blurred into a haze. She treated minor wounds, soothed hysterical victims, and at one point found herself calmly directing a lost evacuation group towards safety, her voice echoing the crisp tones she'd heard Marcus use. There was a strange, desperate satisfaction in it, in being even the smallest cog in this frantic machine of survival. By the time the simulation ended, Zylara was exhausted, splattered with grime and strangely exhilarated. Marcus found her slumped against a wall, blinking dazedly at the lights that now felt too harshly bright. You did good, he said quietly, handing her a canteen of water. It was the highest praise she'd received in all her time on earth. She managed a weak nod of thanks, too drained to even question the unfamiliar warmth spreading through her. The debriefing was brutal. The human analysts were merciless, pointing out flaws in strategy and wasted time. Her fellow Kalshians were subdued, their usual certainty shaken. Zylara knew their thoughts mirrored her own. Somewhere in that simulated chaos, the humans had become frighteningly, undeniably competent. It highlights the importance of overcoming their inclinations, her supervisor Valara said after what felt like an eternity. We must guide them towards cooperation, away from their instinct to dominate. Zylara swallowed, a strange unease settling in her gut. Perhaps the human's single-minded focus wasn't about domination. Perhaps it was something far less comprehensible and infinitely more chilling, a honed instinct for survival born from centuries of relentless bloodshed. Sleep became a stranger in the aftermath of the simulation. Zylara obsessed over the data logs, her dreams haunted by the faces of the simulated victims, both those she'd helped and those she couldn't reach. There was a brutal efficiency to the humans, a willingness to make the hard choices that made her skin crawl. Marcus was the anomaly within the anomaly. He didn't revel in the simulated violence, yet carried an undeniable aura of competence forged in harsh reality. In stolen moments of respite, she sought him out, peppering him with questions that skirted the core issue she was too afraid to address. Tell me about loss, she blurted out one day, the sanitized meeting room suddenly feeling too small. Marcus met her gaze head on. Everyone I've ever served with, he began, voice rough. They're either dead or carry a piece of that death inside them. He ran a calloused hand across his short, cropped hair. There's a price to knowing how to fight, Zylara. It changes you. Change. The echoes of her supervisor's tidy pronouncements seemed laughably naive now. The humans it dawned on her hadn't overcome their warring nature. They had been shaped by it, each individual a product of generational trauma. This realization brought no comfort. It made them even more unpredictable, their potential for both destruction and a self-sacrificial protectionism frighteningly intertwined. The galaxy, with its carefully cultivated alliances and emphasis on peaceful negotiation, seemed ill-equipped to handle this species that burned so intensely. A memory surfaced, a human historical documentary, scenes of soldiers returning home amidst celebrations. Yet their eyes mirrored the haunted look she'd seen in Marcus. 
Even in victory, they seemed irrevocably marked. Marcus, she asked impulsively, the formality of his title abandoned. Do you ever regret it? Regret was a human emotion, complex and layered. She saw it all play out on his face. The weariness, the flicker of pain, and a stubborn defiance. Regret is a luxury, he finally answered, his voice heavy. What I regret is that it was necessary in the first place. His words echoed in the silence that followed. Zylara had no neat counter-argument, no soothing platitude derived from her sheltered life. There was a terrible truth in his statement, an acknowledgment of the harsh reality that her people had long chosen to ignore. Evil existed, conflict existed, and sometimes the only response was to fight back. The pull towards understanding became insatiable. Zylara stopped merely observing the humans and began to seek. She spent hours poring over their literature, the stark brutality of their war epics both repelling and captivating her. She found herself drawn not to the glorified battles, but to the quiet moments in between soldiers sharing a scrap of food, the anguished letters to loved ones, the poems etched in blood and mud. Marcus offered no explanations when she brought him a fragment of a diary salvaged from a long-forgotten human battlefield. He simply read her translation, nodding slowly. Did you know, she found herself asking, her voice barely above a whisper, that they had a concept called shell shock, a physical manifestation of what war did to their minds. We have less poetic names for it now, he replied, the light in his eyes dimming. They sat in silence, a chasm of unspoken pain stretching between them. Zylara, horrified and strangely fascinated, had discovered something vital. The humans not only understood the cost of war, but they carried that understanding within them, in their scars and in their silences. It set them apart she didn't believe any other civilized species documented their capacity for destruction with such unflinching honesty. Her research took another turn when she unearthed a trove of ancient battle tactics manuals. Initially, she was dismayed by the cold calculations, the meticulous planning for mass death. Then a pattern emerged. Amidst the strategies of conquest, there were treatises on defense, on the protection of the vulnerable, on minimizing civilian casualties. Honor, Marcus said gruffly when she confronted him about the peculiar contradictions. Stupid, outdated concept, I know. But it lingered. We fought wars according to rules, even as we got better at breaking them. She stared at him, seeing for the first time the echoes of those ancient warriors in his steady gaze. There was both brutality and a strange nobility in this human, a reflection of the contradictions that tore at his entire species. You are a puzzle, she stated, frustration lacing her voice. We all are, he agreed, a ghost of a smile playing on his lips. To ourselves, most of all. Hope, that ever-present emotion of her kind, felt strangely tarnished. Could humans ever truly transcend their past? And if they did, what would be lost in the process? Would that fierce protectiveness, that stark understanding of sacrifice, disappear too? News of an official inquiry from the Kalshiwan Council came as a jolt, not a surprise. Zylara's reports initially dismissive, then begrudgingly neutral had morphed into something altogether more troubling. Her supervisor, Valara, arrived with two other high-ranking scholars, their disapproval radiating through the pristine observation facility. Your findings, Valara began, her usually serene voice brittle, lack. Objectivity. You appear to be developing a troubling fascination with human aggression. Fascination is a precursor to understanding, Zalara countered, unnerved by her own defiance. Understanding that could be dangerous, one of the stern-faced Kalshians interjected. This species is unstable, unpredictable and ill-prepared for what lurks beyond our carefully managed alliances, Zalora shot back before she could stop herself. The words hung in the air, heavy with unspoken implications. She knew the truth the Council refused to acknowledge. The galaxy was not as safe as they pretended. There were whispers of border skirmishes, of supply lines being raided by unknown ships. The comfortable illusion of universal peace was beginning to crack. The inquiry stretched over several agonizing weeks. Zylara found herself defending not only the humans, but also the complexities within herself. 
her once-ordered worldview began to crumble, replaced by an unsettling mix of unease and a reluctant respect. Marcus was called to testify as well. He spoke bluntly, without the usual deference humans displayed toward her people. There was a raw defiance in him, fueled by the simmering resentment she sensed among his people. Yet his underlying message mirrored her own. The humans were a product of their past, and underestimating that past was a grave error. Do they want peace? Valara asked, a desperate note creeping into her voice. Marcus paused, then offered a chillingly simple answer. They want to survive, and they're willing to do what it takes. The council left without a definitive verdict. Zylara's research project was indefinitely suspended, a thinly veiled censure hanging over her. Word of her controversial stance spread, marking her as an outsider among her own kind. Loneliness, she realized with a touch of bitterness, wasn't a uniquely human condition. Yet it was the touch of a human hand on her shoulder one evening, halting her as she turned to leave the deserted lab that made her isolation feel heavier. You fought for us, Marcus said, the lines on his face etched deeper in the dim light. It matters. Warmth flared in her chest, a wholly unfamiliar and deeply unwelcome reaction to a human. Perhaps she conceded, choosing her words carefully, I fought for a truth you already knew. In the uneasy limbo that followed the council's departure, routine became her refuge. Zylara stubbornly returned to her work, poring over human history with the same fervor she'd once reserved for war. Patterns emerged, eras of relative stability punctuated by flashes of violence, often fueled by desperation, by threats to the core identity of their fractured societies. They fight hardest when they think they have something to lose, she said out loud during one such night, surprised by the certainty in her voice. The observation deck was empty, save for Marcus. His silence was not disinterest, she'd come to learn, but a strange form of respect. He gave her space to think a more subtle support than any of her own kind had offered her in recent months. That sounds like every sentient being, he finally commented. Yes, she mused, staring out at the sprawling human metropolis bathed in the cold light of the moon. But humans do it with a... an intensity that's as frightening as it is impressive. Intensity. It was the word that clung to her mind. That unnerving focus they displayed in the simulation, the stark honesty of their historical records, the way their songs and stories seemed infused with both the beauty and the horror of existence. They were a species of extremes, capable of the noblest sacrifice and the basest cruelty. Zylara had begun to suspect the root of their strength lay in this uncomfortable truth, in their refusal to look away from the darkness within themselves. Her people, in their pursuit of harmonious perfection, had lost something along the way. A vital, if terrible, spark. I think I'm going to broaden my research, she confessed, the words feeling strangely momentous. Marcus turned to her a flicker of surprise in his eyes. Branching out from war. Looking at your contradictions, she said, her voice gaining strength. Your art, philosophy, religion, the things you create in the shadow of your capacity for destruction. He nodded slowly. Might be messy, might even teach you something useful. A ghost of a smile touched her lips. Useful was an understatement. If there was any hope of influencing her people's stance on humanity, of guiding them away from fear and towards a wary understanding, she needed more than just warnings. She needed to show them the full picture. The galaxy was vast, filled with the unknown. Perhaps survival wasn't about sanitizing yourself into complacency, but about embracing the uncomfortable truth that darkness and light could exist within a single species, even within a single heart. The shift in her research focus brought a peculiar mix of relief and fresh anxieties. War, in its terrible simplicity, had been easier to analyze. Human creativity was a tangled, chaotic storm of emotions, expressed in forms that were by turns hauntingly beautiful and bafflingly crude. Art became her new obsession. She lost herself in their music, the raw anguish of a blues melody echoing a soldier's lament she'd read centuries prior. Their paintings held a visceral power, stark landscapes depicting the aftermath of battles, vibrant celebrations of life painted with an exuberant defiance in the face of their ever-present mortality. Marcus was her reluctant guide, bemused and occasionally baffled by her choices. 
Yet, he listened patiently as she tried to articulate the fragmented emotions, these artworks stirred within her, his own explanations refreshingly free of academic pretension. That one, he said, pointing to a sculpture of a twisted, skeletal figure reaching towards the heavens, feels like what it is to come home wrong. Wrong. It was the word she'd been searching for. The humans carried a fundamental wrongness, a wound carved by their own history. Yet their creative spirit seemed to rise in defiance of that wound, an act both futile and achingly magnificent. Zylar began to see a pattern. The humans had never fully healed from their past brutality, but they were also not consumed by it. Instead, they carried its weight, transmuting it into something both unsettling and undeniably potent. A memory surfaced, a phrase from Marcus, uttered in the disorienting aftermath of the simulation, regret is a luxury. There was stark truth in his words. For the Kalshayans, with their long history of cultivated peace, regret was the foundation of progress, a shared cultural understanding of past harm that fueled their insistence on non-violence. The humans had no such luxury. Regret for them was tied to survival, to the grim recognition that sometimes the right choice led to terrible consequences. This, she realized, was the terrifying contradiction at their core. They understood both the necessity of violence and its terrible cost. It was this uneasy knowledge that fueled both their instinct to protect and their capacity for destruction. Her research report began to take shape. It would not be the condemnation the Council expected. Instead, it became a reluctant testament to human resilience, a brutally honest analysis of both their flaws and the strange, undeniable strengths those flaws had forged. The day she submitted her report, an uncharacteristic apprehension gnawed at Zylara. The corridors of the Kalshian Institute had always been her sanctuary. Now they seemed to close in, whispering silent judgments. Valara's reaction was a chilling confirmation of her fears. This isn't scholarship, Zylara, her once mentor said, voice sharp with disapproval. It reads like an apologia for barbarism. It's an honest assessment, Zylara countered, her certainty wavering under the other woman's icy gaze. Facts cannot be tailored to fit our preferred narrative. Facts can be used to manipulate, Valara shot back. You admire their resilience, their willingness to sacrifice. Dangerous sentiments. A dispassionate analysis would recognize that this makes them unpredictable, uncontrollable. They are already uncontrollable, Zalara snapped. It was a foolish outburst, the fear of months finally bursting through her carefully cultivated composure. Silence stretched between them, broken only by the soft hum of the climate control system. Valara was no fool, she likely understood how close Zylara was to truly defecting from their established doctrine. You are. Dismissed for the day, Valara finally said, her dismissal a clear condemnation. The walk back to her assigned quarters was a blur. Zylara, once so confident in her beliefs, now felt adrift. Had she been seduced by the human's intensity, blind to the threat her own people instinctively sensed? Marcus was waiting outside her door when she arrived, a takeout container of some unknown human delicacy in his hands. Wordlessly, he offered it to her, then nudged the door open. Inside, the room that had once felt sterile now held a strange kind of comfort. It had absorbed something of the humans, a defiant messiness, a lingering echo of laughter and blunt conversations. Marcus didn't speak, just handed her a chipped mug filled with a bitter-smelling drink. Tea, he explained, a hint of amusement in his eyes. Supposed to calm you down. Zylata, on any other day, would have meticulously analyzed the drink before even considering tasting it. Today, she took a reckless sip. It was horrendous. She choked, laughter breaking through her despair. Marcus grinned, and for the first time since the Council's arrival, Zylara felt a glimmer of something akin to hope. Perhaps her defiance was contagious. The news broke swiftly, with all the subtlety of a seismic tremor. A distress signal, garbled but undeniably urgent, had pierced the complacent silence of the outer galactic sectors. Unknown ships, wielding unfamiliar weaponry, were attacking a fringe research colony. Chaos ripped through the Kalshayan council chambers. It was the confirmation of their worst fears. The meticulously balanced peace they had cultivated for centuries was a fragile illusion. 
Zylara, summoned for emergency consultation, felt an odd mix of vindication and dread. She had warned them, analyzed human combat strategies, and highlighted the potential value of their grimly practical mindset. Yet all she'd received was censure and thinly veiled mistrust. Now the galaxy was paying the price for their complacency. The human response was brutally efficient. There were no drawn-out debates, no appeals to a galactic community that barely existed in any functional sense. The humans mobilized their warships, their strategists working with a chilling focus that made the Kalshayan emergency protocols seem like hesitant meandering. Marcus found her in an observation room, staring at the tactical projections with a mix of awe and horror. We may not always pick the right fight, he said, his voice tinged with weariness. But damn, do we ever know how to see it through. You don't regret it, she asked, a whisper against the backdrop of organized chaos unfolding across the screens. Every instinct she had clawed at her to retreat from this calculated brutality, yet a traitorous curiosity held her in place. Marcus was silent for a long moment. Then, sometimes, I regret that the galaxy is a place where this, he gestured at the screens, is necessary. Another flash of unwanted understanding. The humans did not revel in violence, but neither could they turn their backs on it. They were protectors forged in fire, their every step haunted by the grim knowledge of what true evil looked like. The Council, in desperation, appointed her the official liaison to the human task force. It was a tacit admission of their complete unpreparedness, their grudging acknowledgement that she understood these savages better than any of them ever would. It was a victory born of catastrophe, and it tasted like ashes in her mouth. The human warship was a marvel of cold functionality. Gone were the pristine labs and cautiously neutral meeting rooms, replaced by control centers thrumming with focused energy, scarred veterans giving orders with chilling efficiency, and an undercurrent of tension that pricked at Zylara's carefully cultivated calm. Marcus moved through the chaos with quiet authority. He was not the highest-ranking officer on board, but the others deferred to him with the ease of shared experience. Zylara, struggling to find her own footing, trailed behind a human officer assigned as her guide. Translator synced. The officer, Lieutenant Park, barked at her. She seemed perpetually on the verge of snapping, her clipped efficiency a desperate armor against the looming battle. Yes, Zylara confirmed, adjusting the earpiece that crackled with a disorienting mix of human voices. Then stick close and try not to be a liability scholar, Park shot back already striding away. Zylara, bristling, followed. This was not the respectful curiosity she'd grown accustomed to on Earth. Here, she was an outsider, her carefully crafted report reduced to a handful of data points on enemy tactics that the humans were already adapting to. Yet the humans also surprised her. She was assigned a translator, a young woman named Ortiz, who between the terse commands and tactical assessments, whispered explanations of human shipboard customs, even a few grim jokes. Ortiz had lost family to earlier border raids and wore her hatred openly, yet there was a kindness beneath the brusque surface. War carves you up, Ortiz said quietly during a rare lull, catching Zylara's gaze. Some pieces get sharper, some turn raw, but we're still people under all that. A flicker of warmth for this angry, hurting human sparked in Zylara's chest. She had been so focused on the collective that she'd neglected to see the individuals the toll this looming conflict had already taken, the weight each human carried. The distress call led them to a ravaged world. Zylara watched in horror as they surveyed the aftermath. Scorched earth, shattered remnants of the research outposts, bodies broken by unknown weapons. The humans moved with grim professionalism, but their muttered curses, the haunted looks they exchanged, betrayed the simmering rage beneath the surface. Not just war, Lieutenant Park said through gritted teeth after reviewing the initial scans. This was methodical, a massacre for its own sake. Zylara had read about such events in human history, always with a detached horror. Now the brutality felt sickeningly present, a stain on the sterile vastness of space. This, she realized with a jolt, was what had forged humanity, a universe that was far crueler than the Kalshayans could ever comprehend. The encounter was shockingly sudden. 
The unknown ships materialized from seemingly thin air, their design eerily organic, bristling with unfamiliar weaponry. The human warship reacted instantly, a testament to their terrifying readiness. Zylara, relegated to an observation room far from the heart of the action, could only watch as the battle erupted, a chaotic ballet of explosions and tactical maneuvers unfolding across the screens too quickly for her to fully process. Orders crackled through the translator, a mix of clipped commands, casualty reports, and grim assessments that dripped with a ruthless pragmatism her sheltered life had ill-prepared her for. Lieutenant Park was an icy whirlwind, her earlier tension transformed into lethal focus. Target their propulsion system, she ordered, if we can cripple their maneuverability. Zylara understood the strategy, a brutal yet logical gamble, a hallmark of human tactics. It was a decision her own kind would have debated endlessly, seeking alternatives, minimizing risk. It was this difference, she realized, that might just save them. The battle raged on. The human ship, outnumbered, took hits. Zylara felt each one as a dull thud in her chest. These weren't simulations, they were humans like Marcus, like Ortiz, perishing in the cold void. A touch of human desperation, ugly and potent, began to seep into her own soul. Then, a breakthrough. As the enemy flagship swerved, their shield systems momentarily faltered. Direct hit to power core imminent, Lieutenant Park barked, a savage triumph cutting through her usual composure. The resulting explosion was blinding. When Zylara dared to look again, the enemy flagship was an expanding cloud of debris. One down, but two still remained. A flicker of a childhood memory, her people's traditional victory celebrations, filled with soothing music and gentle pronouncements of peace restored. The humans were silent. Even in victory, they seemed to understand this was merely a temporary reprieve. Evil didn't disappear, it merely shifted, regrouped. The rest of the battle was a brutal slog. The humans, wounded but unrelenting, utilized every trick, every ounce of tactical brilliance honed over centuries of conflict to turn the tide in their favor. The cost was high Zelata learned the terrible meaning of the phrase acceptable losses, felt her stomach lurch as the human casualty numbers flickered relentlessly higher. Yet they fought on. When the final enemy ship fell, a weary silence descended upon the bridge. No cheers, no triumphant declarations just a bone-deep exhaustion that seemed to seep from the very consoles. Zylara found herself seeking Marcus. He was in the medical bay, standing vigil by a young crew member, his face etched with a grief that mirrored her own disquiet. This wasn't victory, it was mere survival, and survival, she realized, had a bitter taste. The aftermath of the battle left Zylara shaken. The carefully cultivated distance of her scholarly life was irrevocably shattered. She'd witnessed the brutality of intergalactic combat firsthand, felt the cold sting of human loss. The illusion of the galaxy as an inherently safe, ordered place was gone forever. Back on Earth, a strange transformation was taking place. There were no parades for the returning soldiers, no grandiose celebrations. Instead, there was a quiet, somber acknowledgement of sacrifice, a collective grief that ran deeper than any she had ever witnessed among her own kind. She saw it in Marcus's eyes, in the worn lines of his face that seemed to have deepened overnight. There was neither pride nor shame in him, merely a grim acceptance of the price they had paid. We won, he said quietly when they met in the dimly lit memorial hall erected near one of the main human spaceports. But damn, Zylara, at what cost? Humans mourned with an open intensity that both unnerved and moved her. Memorials sprang up in public spaces not sterile obelisks, but tactile remembrances, a left-behind pair of work boots, a child's drawing of a starship, messages scrawled directly onto walls in a defiant outpouring of sorrow. Seeking to understand, Zylara spent hours in those makeshift shrines. The individual lives behind the casualty numbers became achingly real. Lovers left notes filled with longing and quiet despair. Parents wrote letters to children who would never grow old, their words a stark testament to the echoes of war that rippled through generations. Yet she also found defiance. Anger flared through the messages, demands for retribution, a raw determination etched beside the pleas for peace. Here lay the stark truth of the human soul, 
their capacity for love was matched in intensity by their capacity for wrath. The Kalshayans, in their pursuit of harmonious order, had never developed a language for this kind of grief. Their rituals were focused on closure, on the gentle fading of memory. For the humans it seemed their dead were kept fiercely present, their loss a burning coal in the collective consciousness. Was this the key to their resilience, Zylara wondered, this refusal to forget the horrors they had both endured and inflicted? The question echoed unanswered within her, an unsettling counterpoint to the soft strains of a Kalshian peace chant that still lingered in some deep recess of her mind. The council summons arrived with a grim inevitability. Zylara returned to her homeworld filled not with apprehension, but a steely resolve. She'd crossed an invisible line, irrevocably stained by the brutal reality of a galaxy the Kalshians had naively ignored. Valara met her in a chamber unsettlingly reminiscent of an interrogation room. You've become, she began, then faltered, searching for the right word, contaminated, by their need for conflict. They have a need for survival, Zelara countered, meeting her former mentor's gaze without flinching. A need born from a universe far less forgiving than our own. This obsession with justifying them, Valara shook her head in disapproval. It's dangerous, Zylara. You're allowing their darkness to cloud your judgment. Darkness. The word echoed in Zylara's mind. There was darkness in the humans, an undeniable capacity for cruelty born from their bloody history. Yet, to dismiss the complexities of their spirit, to ignore the resilience and love that coexisted so uneasily alongside that darkness, it was that willful blindness that was truly dangerous. The galaxy had teeth, and her people were blissfully unaware they were stepping into its maw. The debate raged on, Zylara presenting not just military analysis derived from the recent conflict, but also the cultural insights she had so painstakingly gathered. She spoke of their art, their music, the strange beauty born from their suffering. She even dared to describe the memorials, knowing her words would likely be met with horror and revulsion. Yet, to her surprise, a few among the council seemed disturbed, not by her contamination, but by their own ignorance. Questions arose hesitant but insistent. Zylara found an unlikely ally in an elder scholar known for his rigid traditionalism. It is disconcerting, he admitted, his usual certainty faltering, to learn that the species responsible for such brutality is also capable of, of profound expressions of grief. Disconcerting. It was a small concession, but a crack in the wall of their self-imposed isolation. Zylara seized upon it, pushing further. They mourn openly, she pressed, because they refuse to become complacent, because forgetting the cost of war leaves them vulnerable to repeating it. The silence that followed her words was a strange kind of victory. The council had not embraced the humans far from it, but neither had they definitively dismissed her warnings. The seeds of doubt had been sown. Zylara returned to earth changed. Her defiance had earned her no accolades, merely a grudging tolerance from her own people. Yet she wore their disapproval as a badge of honor. It meant she had understood something vital about the species she now felt strangely bound to. Her relationship with Marcus deepened, forged in the crucible of their shared experience. They spent long hours together, not debating war anymore, but discussing the complex aftermath. He spoke of the veterans haunted by the conflict of a civilian population struggling with a newfound awareness of the galaxy's dangers. His people were scarred weary, yet a fierce determination burned beneath the surface. One crisp evening, as they stood on the observation deck, looking out at the seemingly peaceful human city, he turned to her. There's a word we have, he said, his voice gruff. Closure, seems your people value it a lot. It is. Important for healing, Zylara replied carefully, recalling her own people's rituals for letting go of pain. Marcus snorted. Sounds nice. We don't do closure. We carry our ghosts with us, remind ourselves of what we lost, what we might lose again if we get soft. His bluntness stung, yet Zylara couldn't dismiss his words. Humans thrived on a strange mix of remembering and pushing forward. It made them unpredictable, undeniably dangerous, yet also fiercely resistant to the complacency that had left so many other species vulnerable. A new purpose ignited within her. 
it was no longer merely about understanding the humans, but also about helping her own kind see them clearly the darkness, the light, and all the complex shades in between. She was an alien looking upon humanity, but perhaps she could also be a bridge, a translator of this messy, terrifying, beautiful species. The task ahead was daunting. Her reports, her arguments before the Council, had been mere fragments of the vast tapestry of human existence. To change the deeply ingrained mindset of her people, she would need more. She would need stories. A smile bloomed on her face as the first threads of a plan started to come together. Stories were, after all, where humans themselves found meaning within their own chaos. Perhaps it was the key to finally showing her people their reflection in this strange, scarred, resilient species. The project began quietly, almost subversively. Zylara returned to her research, but with a renewed focus. She sought out human narratives in every form she could find. Battle diaries transcribed oral histories, even the garish entertainment vids humans seemed so fond of were meticulously analyzed. At first, the process was disorienting. Human narratives were infused with a raw emotional directness that often jarred against her own people's preference for nuanced subtlety. Yet, within that bluntness, she found a devastating honesty, a willingness to delve into the darkness of the human soul, both individual and collective. There were the expected tales, stories of heroism, of sacrifice, of camaraderie under fire. Yet, she also unearthed narratives that would likely horrify the Council, accounts of atrocities committed in the fog of war, confessions of the cruel exhilaration of combat, and the haunting emptiness that consumed some veterans in the aftermath. Marcus, while initially baffled by her hunger for these stories, became a reluctant collaborator. You won't like all of it, he warned, handing her a worn data pad containing frontline memoirs scrawled by soldiers in moments stolen from battle. He was right. Some tales were saturated with bloodlust, a chilling reminder of the destructive potential humans carried. Yet others pulsed with guilt, with despair, with a deeply human desire for peace, even amidst the horrors of war. None of it was simple, none of it was easily reconcilable with the Kalshinian ideals of harmony. It was messy, contradictory, and unnervingly real. This is your truth, she told him after a particularly grueling night spent deciphering fragmentary recordings. All of it, not just the parts we find noble. Marcus regarded her for a long moment, then nodded. Maybe, he conceded, maybe showing your people the full picture is the kind of weapon we actually need. Word of her unorthodox research began to spread. Some, like Valara, dismissed it as further proof of her descent into barbarism. Others, mostly the younger scholars chafing under the rigid orthodoxy, were intrigued. Zylara found herself at the center of clandestine gatherings, sharing the stories that burned in her mind. At the back of the makeshift lecture halls, she sometimes spotted stoic Kalshayan elders, drawn by a mix of horror and desperate curiosity. Her work was a form of defiance, a quiet rebellion against the blindness she knew would endanger them all. The human term was grassroots movement. It was clumsy to translate into her own language, yet it perfectly expressed the slow, spreading shift happening within Kalshayan society. Her narratives, shared first in hushed whispers, then in bolder symposiums, were seeping into the collective consciousness. The reaction was complex, just as she'd expected. Horror warred with a reluctant fascination. Fear battled with a dawning realization that their carefully cultivated sense of security in the galaxy was dangerously naive. For the first time in centuries, there was true debate, a fiery clash of ideas. Zylara became a controversial figure. Some lauded her as a visionary, bravely exposing the truths they had long ignored. Others branded her a traitor, corrupted by the savage species she championed. Threats, veiled and not so veiled, materialized on her data pad. Yet, fueled by a mix of fear and stubborn determination, she pressed on. Her defiance found an unlikely echo within Marcus. He, always a soldier to the core, began to speak more openly about the cost of war, not with glory-seeking tales, but with accounts of the lingering trauma his fellow veterans bore. His blunt honesty shocked many, yet resonated deeply with others. There were hushed rumors of secret support groups forming, of whispered shared experiences hidden beneath the facade of normalcy. You've started them arguing, he stated one evening, 
both weariness and a spark of grim amusement in his eyes. That's something, even if half of them probably want to space us both. He wasn't wrong. The cracks within Kalshayan society were widening into dangerous chasms. Yet Zylara clung to a strange hope. Conflict often preceded change, and change, however painful, was desperately needed. The Council, faced with this growing unrest, was caught between its ingrained complacency and the dawning fear that they were losing control of the narrative. In a desperate attempt to appease both factions, they made a catastrophic error. They authorized a public exhibition. Zalara's human stories, carefully curated and sanitized, were to be displayed alongside Kalshayan artifacts, showcasing the enduring strength of peace. It was meant to be a show of unity, a reassurance that they could learn from the humans without embracing their brutality. It backfired spectacularly. The exhibition was a grotesque mockery of both cultures. The sanitized human narratives, stripped of their raw emotional power, were displayed alongside serene Kalshayan sculptures and soothing musical compositions. The intended message was clear. Humanity's darkness could be studied, even pitied, as a cautionary tale highlighting the superiority of the Kalshayan path. The opening ceremony was a tense, brittle affair. Zylara, forced into a role akin to a curator of curiosities, found herself face to face with Valara, her former mentor now the face of the old guard. See, Zylara, Valara said, disapproval lacing her voice. Even their suffering can be rendered palatable, a tool for reinforcing our own values. This is not the truth, Zylara countered, her voice echoing in the vastness of the exhibition hall. This, she gestured at the displays, is a lie meant to make us feel superior safe. It's the very complacency that will doom us. The clash quickly spilled beyond the confines of the gallery. The exhibition became a rallying point, a stage for both pro-peace advocates determined to cling to the old ways and those who echoed Zylora's warnings. Protests erupted initially peaceful, then marred by isolated instances of violence. The galaxy, long oblivious to the internal strife of the reclusive Kalshayans, was now watching with a mix of curiosity and disquiet. Reports of a potential civil war within a supposedly advanced, pacifist society were a source of both fascination and deep concern. Marcus stood with her, an unsettlingly calm anchor amid the swirling chaos. Looks like the fight's come to us, he said grimly, watching footage of escalating protests on his datapad. I never thought I'd miss the simplicity of facing an external enemy. Zylata, fear clawing at her, saw a different kind of war brewing. It was not fought with spaceships or blasters, but with words, ideas, and deeply held beliefs. This battle was for the soul of her people, and the outcome was far from certain. Yet, in the midst of the chaos, a sliver of hope remained. The Kalshayans had never truly fought for anything not for territory, not for resources. Their comfort had bred passivity. This conflict, this terrible awakening, was forcing them to choose to take a stand. For perhaps the first time in their long history, they truly had something at stake. This, Zylara thought with a fierce determination, might just be their saving grace. The crisis reached its peak with terrifying swiftness. A fringe faction, radicalized by the fear-mongering and the diluted human narratives on display, launched a desperate, ill-conceived attack on a human diplomatic outpost. It was a small skirmish, swiftly crushed by human security forces, but the damage was done. The galaxy erupted. Previously neutral species, already unnerved by the reports of the Kelshian instability, were quick to condemn the unprovoked aggression. Fear-fueled rumors twisted through the news networks, whispers of a hidden Kelshian war fleet, tales of their scholars secretly devising horrific weapons gleaned from their study of the humans. Zylara watched in despair as the fragile peace she had fought so hard for crumbled into paranoia. Her people, never forced to confront the harsher realities of the galaxy, were recoiling in terror. All her work, all her attempts to showcase humanity's complexity, seemed to have backfired spectacularly. They saw only the monster they had always feared. Marcus found her hunched over a flickering datapad filled with increasingly frantic news reports. We were always the backup plan, he said, his voice hollow. Study them, learn from them, just in case everything went wrong. Looks like everything is finally here. His grim pragmatism was a slap in the face. 
All along, while she had desperately tried to foster understanding, her people had been preparing for the betrayal she now saw reflected in the eyes of countless terrified Kalshayans. Yet even amidst her despair, a stubborn defiance took root. It had been naive to think that bridging the gap between two such vastly different species would be easy, that her words alone could erase centuries of mistrust on both sides. They need to see, she said with a newfound determination. Not those, she gestured in disgust at the data pad, but the truth. The whole, unfiltered, ugly and beautiful truth of who humans are. Marcus met her gaze, and for the first time she saw a flicker of something resembling hope in his eyes. Crazy enough. It might just work. The plan was audacious, reckless, and born out of sheer desperation. Technically, it was treason. Yet, Zylara had long ago crossed the line from respected scholar to defiant outsider. Marcus, leveraging contacts forged during the recent war, secured the cooperation of a media group known for its blunt disregard for neutrality and a hunger for sensational stories. It was not the respectable, nuanced broadcast she would have chosen under different circumstances, but the time for careful diplomacy was long gone. The transmission went out unsanctioned, a rogue broadcast hijacking channels across the known galaxy. Zylara's face, now synonymous with controversy, filled countless screens. She presented not a polished report, not a careful defense, but a raw, unfiltered outpouring of human stories. War, yes, with all its brutality, but also courage that bordered on madness, self-sacrifice that defied logic, and a well of grief so deep it threatened to swallow her whole. Clips of soldiers screaming in battle were juxtaposed with quiet confessions of survivors, laughter echoing against scenes of utter devastation. This is not a sanitized monster, she told her audience, her voice trembling not with fear, but with a desperate plea for understanding. This is a mirror showing us what we are capable of, what we might become if we don't open our eyes. The reactions were a chaotic symphony. Her own people were horrified and disgusted, yet many of the younger generation were transfixed. Other species, previously dismissive of the Kalshayan internal strife, now watched with fear-laced fascination. This was not a theoretical discussion of a distant threat. This was a species laying bare its own darkness, a cry for help that was as chilling as it was undeniably compelling. The broadcast wasn't a call for peace or even for alliance. It was a brutal self-examination, a desperate gamble that in revealing the worst of humanity, she might awaken both fear and a grudging respect. That this terrifyingly potent species was also capable of profound self-reflection. In the aftermath, she was arrested. Yet there were no neat pronouncements of guilt, no swift punishment. The Kalshian Council, once so monolithic, was now a fractured echo of itself. Her trial became a debate far larger than her own actions. It became a referendum on the future of her entire world. And as the galaxy watched, her people were forced to confront a question they had long avoided. In a universe filled with threats, could they cling to their naive pacifism, or was there a terrifying strength in finally understanding what it truly meant to fight for survival? Zylara's time in confinement was not what she'd expected. No harsh interrogations, no austere cell. Instead, she found herself with time, a strange and unsettling luxury. Her cell was a comfortably furnished room, more akin to enforced house arrest. Guards were posted outside, but there was a peculiar tension rather than outright hostility in the air. She even had carefully monitored access to the news feeds, a mixed blessing that brought both updates on her trial and a constant onslaught of speculation and vitriol directed her way. Strangest of all, she had visitors. Kalshayan elders, drawn perhaps by morbid curiosity, came to engage her in debate. Young idealists sought her out, confessing their fears and hopes as the galaxy teetered on the brink of a war fueled largely by the broadcast she had unleashed. She answered their questions, no longer seeking to justify the humans, but forcing her own people to confront the difficult choices, the compromises inherent in survival. Her arguments echoed the contradictions she saw within humanity itself the beauty and the horror wound tightly together. Word reached her of Marcus, not broken by the backlash as some predicted, but rallying the veterans, turning their pain and weariness into a potent political force. He's making you look reasonable, 
Valara had said with a touch of grudging respect during one of their surprisingly civil debates. The trial itself was a spectacle, a microcosm of the galaxy's turmoil. Every word was dissected, with Zylara cast as either a visionary savior or a traitor who had doomed them all. Yet through it all ran a strange undercurrent a grudging recognition that there was no going back to their sheltered naivety. The galaxy had turned its eyes on them, and they could no longer pretend to be untouched by its dangers. The verdict, when it finally came, was anticlimactic. Exile. A harsh punishment wrapped in a veneer of mercy. Zylara had expected nothing less. Her crime wasn't merely revealing the truth, but shattering the comforting illusions her people had cherished for so long. As she stepped onto the transport ship that would take her beyond the boundaries of her homeworld, an unlikely figure waited for her. Valara, her carefully composed façade cracked with a mix of anger and a strange, desperate hope. You have poisoned us, Zylara, she said, the accusation edged with quiet despair, with doubt, fear, and with the necessity of choice. It may be the only antidote to the far more dangerous poison, Zylara replied, meeting her former mentor's eyes, the poison of comfortable delusion. Exile was a lonely echo of her early research days on Earth. She was granted refuge on a backwater research station, given access to data streams, but carefully isolated from any position of influence. Word reached her in fragments, escalating border conflicts, trade routes disrupted by opportunistic raiders, and a growing chorus of voices demanding the Kalshians take a stand. There were whispers, too, of a human-led initiative, a coalition of minor species seeking a powerful ally in the looming conflict. Marcus, it seemed, had not retreated from the chaos she helped engineer, but was reshaping it to his species' advantage. It was a testament to their terrifying adaptability. Her own role was reduced to that of an observer, yet one burdened with intimate knowledge. She spent sleepless nights analyzing reports, seeking patterns, trying to predict the next flashpoint. Each casualty count filled her with a dread that was both personal, tied to her memory of real human faces, and coldly analytical, honed by forced understanding of galactic politics. One day, a transmission arrived. It was not from the Kalshayan Council, nor from a desperate plea by a threatened species. The sender was Marcus. The footage was raw, unedited. A chaotic battlefield, not against unknown attackers, but in a vicious civil war that had erupted on a resource-rich world. Kalshayans fought against each other, idealists clinging to their pacifism versus a new, hardened faction armed with hastily acquired weapons and fueled by the fear she had helped ignite. Your people are bleeding, Marcus said, any trace of warmth gone from his voice. And for what? An ideal that makes them easy prey. You saw the truth in us, Zylara. It's time they found it in themselves. His words were not an accusation, but a grim statement of fact. Seeing her people fractured, turning on each other in the face of galactic threats, brought a despair sharper than any she had felt in exile. It was the confirmation of her greatest fear that in shattering their naivete she had left them not with the tools to survive, but with the seeds of internal destruction. Yet, buried beneath the despair, a defiant ember flickered. She had set a fire, yes, but it was still burning. Her people were lost, confused, but they were no longer blind, and in that painful awakening lay their only hope. Her return to her homeworld was not sanctioned, more akin to a desperate infiltration than a triumphant homecoming. She found a society on the brink of collapse, yet also one thrumming with a desperate, terrified energy that was eerily familiar. It echoed the raw focus of the humans under attack, the grim determination born from having their backs against the wall. Zylara had expected condemnation, even arrest upon her unauthorized return. Instead, she was hauled before the shattered remnants of the council and greeted with a desperate plea for help. Teach us, Zylata, one of the elders begged, the certainty she'd once projected gone, replaced by a terrified vulnerability. Teach us to fight, not for conquest, but for survival. It was the request she had both longed for and dreaded. Her people, forced out of their complacency, were now staring into the abyss. It was up to her to show them it was a place they could navigate, even conquer, without losing the core of their spirit. The transformation that followed was brutal and swift. For the first time in their long history, the Kalshayans were humbled, 
forced to become students instead of aloof observers. Zylara, alongside a reluctant Marcus and his scarred veterans, became their unlikely instructors. The lessons were not in tactics alone. The Kalshayans had brilliant theorists, but lacked the grim pragmatism forged in the crucible of real war. Zylara taught them of triage of sacrifice of the terrible choices no amount of philosophy could prepare you for. Marcus shattered their illusions of clean warfare, forcing them to confront the brutality inherent in any struggle for survival. Yet, she also shared the stories she had so carefully gathered tales of human resilience, their strange mix of ruthlessness and compassion, and their insistence on remembering those they had lost. This is the cost, she told her once serene people, now hardened by a crash course in the galactic realities. Carry it with you, make it fuel your determination, but never forget the price of survival. There were stumbles, bitter arguments, and moments when the old pacifism seemed ready to consume them all. Yet, pressed against the looming threat of outside aggression and the remnants of their own destructive civil war, a new path began to emerge. It was not an echo of humanity, but a uniquely Kalshayan adaptation. They developed defensive strategies based on their technological strengths, formed alliances built on careful assessment rather than blind trust, and even created their own corps of healers specifically trained for battlefield trauma, a chilling testament to their new understanding of warfare. When the attack finally came, a coordinated raid on their outlying research posts, the Kalshayans were not the pacifist scholars the raiders expected. They fought back not with a bloodlust Marcus had feared, but with a focused, terrifying efficiency. They took casualties, mourned their dead with the openness humans had displayed, and then redoubled their efforts. Zylara watched the battle unfold not with a detached observation of her past, but with the gut-churning dread of one who truly understood the stakes. This was her fight now, as much as it was theirs. The war, when it inevitably escalated, was unlike anything Zylara could have foreseen. It was messy, brutal, and fueled as much by greed and desperation as any grand ideology. The carefully crafted coalition Marcus had nudged into existence quickly fractured under the strain of real conflict. Yet, there were moments of unexpected unity, Kalshayan defensive tech saving a human outpost from annihilation, human warriors breaking a siege with their unrelenting tenacity, species previously written off as insignificant revealing their own unique strengths in the crucible of battle. Marcus became a figure of grudging respect and more than a little fear. This was not a war of conquest on their part, but one of calculated, ferocious defense. His troops were scarred cynical, yet bound by something more potent than mere patriotism. They had seen the abyss and were determined to drag everyone within their alliance back from the brink. It made them unpredictable, infuriating, and utterly indispensable. Zylara, with agonizing clarity, found herself understanding the Council's initial reluctance to embrace the humans. They were not a weapon to be wielded, but a storm to be weathered. Yet in that storm she saw flickers of brilliance, of a desperate hope born out of humanity's long history of struggle. She worked relentlessly, not on battlefield strategy, but on the battle for hearts and minds. She shared her archive of human stories with anyone who would listen. The tales became a shield against despair, a bitter fuel against complacency, and a grim reminder of why this fragile alliance was worth the terrible cost. A new role emerged for her, not a scholar, translator, or a strategist, but a keeper of stories. War, she had finally realized, was fought as much with memories as it was with weapons. The turning point was not a grand battle, but a quiet act of defiance. A small, resource-poor world found itself caught between two warring factions. Facing annihilation, the inhabitants did something utterly unexpected. They began broadcasting their stories. Tales of everyday life, of hopes and fears, of small joys and quiet heartbreaks poured out of the doomed world. They echoed the raw urgency of the human broadcasts Zylara had once unleashed, but this time from a species with no history of warfare. It was the galaxy's innocence weaponized, a chilling reminder that behind the troop counts and political maneuvers were lives worth saving. The ceasefire that followed was as fragile as it was monumental. The war sputtered on, yet there was a shift, a weariness that seeped into the collective consciousness. 
The fight was no longer merely about territory or resources, but the desperate desire of countless species to preserve something more precious than any material gain, the right to simply exist. The aftermath was a strange thing. There was no grand declaration of victory, no neat treaty to mark the end of the conflict. Instead, there was a weary, wounded galaxy, burdened with the knowledge of its own capacity for self-destruction. Humans were begrudgingly acknowledged as a force to be reckoned with. Not universally loved, nor completely trusted, but respected in a way they had never been before. Zalara witnessed Marcus wearily navigating the treacherous waters of galactic diplomacy, his blunt honesty a jarring counterpoint to the usual posturing and veiled threats. Her own people held a tenuous position in this new order. They were no longer naive, yet they retained a core that was fundamentally different from those who had lived through centuries of conflict. The Kalshayan focus on healing, on finding paths back from the trauma of war, made them reluctantly sought after allies. Zylara found herself neither an exile nor a hero. Her role had become far more nuanced. She traveled extensively, documenting the stories of this changed galaxy. There were tales of loss, of broken worlds and fractured alliances. Yet, woven within them, she meticulously recorded moments of resilience, of fragile truces born from shared grief, and of unlikely friendships forged in the aftermath of conflict. Marcus remained a constant, if often infuriating, presence in her life. Their bond was tempered by war, an uneasy mix of shared experience and the fundamental divide that still existed between their species. They argued fiercely, debated endlessly, yet beneath it lay a mutual respect, and a strange echo of the camaraderie she'd witnessed among his soldiers. One evening, on a dimly lit space station, orbiting a world rebuilding after a devastating siege, he found her hunched over her ever-present datapad. You keep picking at it, he said, his voice rough. Like the wound will heal differently if you just tell the story right. His words stung, for she knew it was true. The war was over, but it echoed within her, a constant reminder of the darkness she'd helped unleash both in the galaxy and within herself. They need to understand the cost, she replied, a quiet defiance in her voice. So it doesn't happen again. And if it does, Marcus asked bluntly. Zylara had no answer, only the grim knowledge that evil wasn't a beast you slayed once, but a shadow that always lurked at the edges of existence. Yet there was something vital in remembering, in safeguarding the stories of both the darkness and the stubborn flicker of hope that persisted against all odds. Perhaps that, she finally realized, was her true purpose, not to bring lasting peace, for there likely was none to be found in this chaotic universe, but to be the unflinching witness, the relentless chronicler, to ensure that alongside any battle tactic, any political agreement, there always remained the human and the Kalshayan, and the countless other stories. For in those stories, messy, painful, and hauntingly beautiful, lay both the seeds of destruction and the stubborn, enduring spark of something better. Years turned into decades, fading into that strange blur of time that seemed unique to space-faring civilizations. Zylara aged, her once smooth chitin developing faint ridges, a testament to the relentless pace of her travels. Marcus, to her quiet surprise, showed the toll of time far more harshly. His hair had gone completely gray, scars she distinctly remembered him acquiring in battle, now seemed etched deeper into his skin. Humans, it seemed, carried the cost of survival etched in their very bodies. Their paths diverged and intertwined in a strange, unpredictable dance. She found him sometimes on backwater planets, not as the feared general, but surprisingly as a teacher. He trained local militias, his words clipped and harsh, yet infused with a desperate urgency born from knowing the stakes firsthand. Their arguments continued, sometimes spanning multiple systems, as they fired off heated transmissions to one another. She accused him of fueling the paranoia that always festered beneath the surface of galactic politics. He countered that naivety was a far more dangerous contagion than preparedness. Neither of them ever truly conceded, for they both knew there was a grim truth in their opposing stances. Zylara's archive grew exponentially. It was no longer merely a collection of war stories, but the sprawling tapestry of a galaxy grappling with its own scars. 
There were tales of uneasy truces, of trade agreements born from the ashes of battlefields, of cross-species initiatives to rebuild and to heal. There were also chilling accounts of worlds spiraling back into conflict, of old hatreds reigniting. It was a constant, sobering reminder that true peace might be an impossible ideal, yet the pursuit of it was what kept them from succumbing entirely to the darkness. One seemingly unremarkable transmission request made her hands tremble. It was from Earth, from an organization bearing a hauntingly familiar human title, the Memorial Project. They wanted access to her archives, specifically the stories of war told not in the sanitized voice of history, but through the raw pain of individual experiences. The humans, it seemed, had embraced their own tradition of remembrance. At first, the thought filled her with a flicker of dread. This was the species that had once built victory arches and joyous parades to commemorate their triumphs. Yet over the years she'd witnessed a shift. Their remembrances were infused with a somber weight, a brutal acknowledgement of the cost paid for mere survival. She agreed. The exchange was not a triumphant declaration of interspecies unity, but a begrudging transaction filled with unspoken tensions. Yet within it lay a strange power. These stories she had so carefully collected, once used to shock her own people out of complacency, were now being sought out by those who had shed the blood behind those tales. It was the ultimate testament to her work. The humans were embracing the fullness of their own history, not in a celebration of brutality, but in a stark acknowledgement of the slippery slope between survival and self-destruction. They were choosing to remember not because they sought war, but because they understood, with a clarity born from experience, the vital need to fight for something better. The summons from her homeworld was the one she never expected. Not a trial, not a condemnation, but a plea whispered through official channels with an undertone of desperate curiosity. The Calchaean Council, or what was left of its once formidable authority, needed her expertise. She returned to find a changed society, still peaceful, yet with a new, hard-won understanding of the darkness that swirled beyond their borders. The younger generation, the ones who had listened to her warnings as frightened children, were now the quiet architects of this change. They spoke of measured responses, of strategic alliances, of a way to harness their unique ability to analyze and heal for the benefit of the fragile order that barely held. It was not the echo of humanity she had once feared, but something new, a tentative step on their own evolutionary path. Her role was that of a seasoned advisor, a grim reminder of battles fought and lessons learned. They came to her not for stories of human valor, but for the tales of Calchaean resilience, the quieter acts of courage that had been dismissed as weakness in those long-gone days of comfortable oblivion. She told stories of healers tending to the wounded under fire, of brilliant scholars developing defensive protocols not for conquest, but for the protection of the vulnerable, of artists finding poignant beauty amidst the ruins of war. And because she knew they could now stomach the darkness, she sometimes shared the harsher tales, of tactical decisions that sacrifice lives for the greater good, of the quiet despair that haunted soldiers long after the battle was won, of the lingering fear that hummed beneath the surface of their new, tenuous peace. One day, a young scholar approached her, a flicker of horrified fascination in his eyes. We were so blind, he whispered, echoing her own thoughts from those desperate days. We were, Zylara agreed quietly, and now we see more clearly both the darkness out there and the strength within ourselves. The elder statesmen, those who still clung to the old ways, grumbled and whispered accusations of warmongering. Zylara let them. She had learned from the humans a grudging acceptance of being misunderstood. It was a small price to pay for survival. News from Marcus grew sparse. There were whispers of him on remote outposts, still training, still preparing, a grim sentinel in a galaxy that seemed to lurch from one crisis to the next. Her own path led her to a small, unassuming research station. Here, her endless archive was housed, a testament to countless lives lived in the crucible of galactic unrest. Yet it was not a monument to despair, but a place of learning. Young scholars from across known space came, seeking not just the dry statistics of war, but the echo of heartbeats beneath the armor, the flicker of hope within the ruin. She walked among them, not as a revered elder dispensing wisdom, but as a relentless seeker herself. 
there was always another story to collect, another flickering light to preserve before the darkness could consume it entirely. The twilight of her life was marked by a peculiar form of tranquility. It wasn't the serene complacency of her early days, but a kind of weary acceptance. The galaxy was still a dangerous, messy place. Wars continued to flare and fade, peace treaties crumbled, and new threats emerged from the uncharted depths. Yet there was a subtle shift. The Kalshayans were no longer passive observers, but cautious players in the grand game. They had become protectors, mediators, and sometimes, when absolutely necessary, warriors fueled by a fierce desire to safeguard the hard-won right to exist without constant fear. Marcus found her one quiet evening on the research station's observation deck, a place they both unconsciously gravitated towards. The wrinkles on his face had deepened, turning his weathered countenance into a harsh landscape etched with a lifetime of battle. His once formidable physique had thinned, a warrior's body slowly yielding to the relentless pull of time. They stood in silence, gazing at a starfield punctuated by the faint scars of past conflicts. We did a terrible thing, he finally said, the admission barely louder than a sigh. Zylara considered his words. A necessary thing, she corrected quietly. We forced the galaxy to open its eyes. It hurt them. It hurt us all. But look. She gestured at the starfield. At least now they're trying not to close them again. Marcus gave a harsh huff of reluctant agreement. They lapsed back into silence, a comfortable quiet born from shared burdens and roads that diverged yet somehow led to the same weary destination. You ever think about what comes after, he asked, his gravelly voice filled with a vulnerability that was new to him. Not the fear of a soldier facing death, but the quiet dread of a man confronted with the relentless march of time. Every day, Zalara confessed. Her archives were a testament to that fear, an attempt to claw something enduring from the relentless chaos of existence. The stories, Marcus mused, they'll outlast us. It wasn't a boast, but a simple truth. Perhaps, Zylara replied, perhaps that's all we can hope for. We fought. Not so there'd be endless battles, but moments in between them worth remembering. The last dregs of light faded from the sky. Yet, against the backdrop of the now star-dusted darkness, she saw flickers of color, rebuilt cities, replanted fields on scorched planets, tentative laughter echoing amidst the ruins. It was fragile, tenuous, and it might not last, but it existed. The old Zylara might have found despair in that uncertainty. Now she felt a strange kind of peace. True peace remained elusive, likely always would. But the relentless pursuit, the fight to preserve those flickering moments of light against the encroaching darkness. Perhaps that was enough. There was no grand deathbed scene for Zylara. No final pronouncements on a life spent chronicling the consequences of conflict. Instead, there was simply the end. Her body, pushed far beyond its natural lifespan by Kalshian medical advancements, finally gave out. It was a quiet fading away, more a gentle flicker than a sudden extinguishing of the flame. There was a peculiar ceremony, as befit her unusual legacy. Her form, adorned with the simple trappings of a scholar, was laid to rest not in the serene gardens like other Kalshian elders, but on the windswept edge of their homeworld, facing towards the vast expanse of space. Kalshian tradition held that the gentle breezes would carry the spirit of the departed toward their ancestral home. Zylara, ever the anomaly, would journey outward, symbolically returning to those countless worlds she had chronicled. Her memorial was not a statue or an elegant data repository, but a raw, open wound carved into the landscape. A scar, explained the young scholar who was her reluctant successor. To remind us that healing is incomplete, that the battle, whatever form it takes, forever continues. Marcus was not present. Whether it was by choice or by grim circumstance, no one dared to ask. Yet she somehow knew he was out there, still fighting, still training, still refusing to yield, even when faced with the inevitable defeat of time itself. Her archive was her true legacy. It had become a vast, decentralized collection spanning countless worlds, woven into galactic educational systems and political discourse. Her stories, once tools for shock and provocation, had transformed into something far more potent. Reminders, echoed through generations, of both the terrible cost of conflict 
and the enduring strength of the sentient spirit. War still raged. The galaxy was far from the harmonious utopia her people had once naively envisioned. Yet there was a change, a stubborn defiance against the encroaching dark. Peace treaties now included stipulations for remembrance, for the conscious preservation of the individual stories beneath the grand narratives. Healing was prioritized alongside rebuilding. The humans, as volatile as ever, were surprisingly at the forefront of this movement. Their memorials, blunt and unapologetic, became places of pilgrimage. Their insistence on confronting their brutal past had a ripple effect, forcing other species to acknowledge their own buried scars. It was messy, often painful and far from any true reconciliation but it was a start, a flicker of hope that perhaps they might chart a path where survival wasn't always synonymous with relentless bloodshed. Xylata, as the relentless keeper of stories, became a figure woven into galactic myth. Some painted her as a grim-faced warrior, a stark reminder of the horrors from which she was forged. Others saw her as a figure of quiet compassion, a testament to the enduring power of the sentient spirit even amidst the ruins. The truth, as always, was far more complicated. Centuries turned into a blur, the relentless march of time echoing the endless cycle of conflict and fragile respites that punctuated the galaxy's existence. Zylara's name lingered, a whisper in academic archives, a cautionary tale spun to wide-eyed young scholars, a symbol invoked in political speeches that straddled the line between stirring a thirst for peace and fueling the paranoia that simmered beneath galactic alliances. No one ever quite agreed on who she had truly been, but the stories those endured. On Earth, in a sprawling memorial park built amidst the remnants of an ancient battlefield, a peculiar tradition had taken root. Soldiers, scarred and stoic, gathered here not to celebrate past triumphs, but to contribute fragments to a strange, ever-evolving mosaic. A shard of chipped armor, a child's drawing of a fallen city, lovingly preserved under a thin layer of protective glass, a single musical note scrawled on a charred piece of data sheet each item added was another story echoing through time. There were no grand speeches, no cheering crowds, just a quiet, solemn acknowledgement and the relentless collection of pain transformed into something hauntingly, stubbornly beautiful. On a backwater world ravaged by a recent border skirmish, a group of weary healers stumbled upon an abandoned dwelling. Inside, etched into the crumbling wall in a script barely recognizable as an ancient form of Kalshian, was a simple phrase, darkness exists, so does hope. There was no signature, but they knew. Stories had a way of finding the places they were needed most. And orbiting Xylora's distant homeworld, a small, unassuming beacon hummed quietly in the vast emptiness. Her archive pulsed here, its existence barely known, yet vital. Young Kalshians and those from countless other species still came seeking not tales of heroism or grand strategy, but the simple humanizing ones, a soldier's stifled sob echoing amidst battlefield wreckage, a defiant act of creation in a desolate refugee camp, the raw confession of a seasoned diplomat admitting their terror on the eve of a high-stakes negotiation. For somewhere out in that uncaring vastness Marcus, if he yet endured, trained his soldiers with grim determination. Politicians schemed and maneuvered with an uneasy awareness of the true cost of every decision. Species collaborated, clashed, yet carried the weight of their shared history, a constant reminder that peace was a fragile, hard-won thing. The galaxy was far from perfect. Perhaps it never would be. And yet, as a young Kalshayan with fire in her eyes and a datapad filled with millennia of meticulously preserved pain and resilience stood at the edge of the memorial scar, Facing the star-strewn void, Zylara would have recognized something vital. Not victory, not a lasting peace, but a choice. A relentless, stubborn, and sometimes even beautiful choice to fight, to heal, to remember. A choice to keep adding to the sprawling, chaotic mosaic of existence, another battle won, another scar earned, another flicker of defiant hope pulsating against the encroaching darkness.